Thank you uh, for the uh, introduction. I am uh, very happy and glad to be here. Um, I'll talk to you today about the role of material science and specifically the nanosciences um, in information processing systems for the future. Um, a lot of this work was done with my colleagues at IBM, uh, at, uh, now at Rutgers and uh, also Gallo in California. Um, so in 1662, Robert Boyle, who is considered the father of uh, modern chemistry, and is the Boyle of the famous Boyle's Law, gave 24 things, a list of 24 things that he uh, wanted to see okay, uh, in terms of technology. And if you look through the list, it is very interesting. Prolongation of life, the art of flying, the art of continuing underwater, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But of this 20 list of 24 items, um, Roughly about a third have not been realized yet. About a half to two thirds have been realized or have almost been realized. Uh, and, the, and a bunch of them, a huge, a big fraction of them uh, are things related to nanomaterials and material science. And those I've highlighted in yellow. So for instance, the transmutation of metals. Uh, you can do it, but it is not economically feasible today. The making of glass malleable. Nobody has been able to do that today. No, glass remains brittle. Uh, the liquid alkaest and other dissolving menstruums, that's item number 13. They use uh, medieval English terms, but basically it is asking for a universal solvent. Uh, now, if you had a universal solvent, there would be nothing to store it in because it would dissolve the container. So that's a little bit of a problem. Uh, a perpetual light at the bottom. Um, I think with solid state lighting, uh, that has arrived today. But of all this list of 24 items, uh, there's one item that is, um, that is missing over here. And can someone point out what that is? Any, any guesses? It's the need for, for computing. It doesn't exist in this list, even though Robert Boyle was a good mathematician. At that time, the logarithmic tables had already come out. And at that time, people were already trying to make mechanical computers. Uh, but information processing, computing, that is uh, glaringly absent in this list. And that is going to be the subject of my talk today. So if you, the graph at the top is from Ray Kurzweil. And it shows how much, how much computational power has increased over the years. The amount of computing that $1,000 can buy has gone up by about 16 orders of magnitude in the past 100 years. And about nine of those orders of magnitude have come in the past 40 years. Okay. And it has arrived to us because of the advances in integrated circuits and silicon microelectronics. If you look at, here is an example at the bottom. If you look at memory, um, this is a five kilobyte memory in 1956. It is almost the size of an aircraft. Right? And this was in state of the art in IBM in 1956. This is roughly state of the art today, 500 gigabytes on a 25, two and a half inch memory. We can all buy this in the stores today. And on the right is what one may consider the limits. This is, these are 12 um, ion atoms that together form a bit of memory. And so um, 96 ion atoms form a byte. This in theory, means that two and a half inches will store 500,000 gigabytes. So this is, you can think of this as sort of a fundamental limit for memory storage where it comes down to the spin of a single atom, or in this case, actually a cluster of 12 atoms. Okay. But this is what microelectronics progress has done for us today. Going forward, however, things are going to change. Uh, a lot of this progress that has happened today is because we have been able to make 
transistors smaller and faster and cheaper. But if you look at the essential architecture of the computer, that has not changed in about 70 years or so. It is more or less the same as it was in the 1940s. Okay. So today, when we think about a conventional computer, we use von Neumannian computing, where we use you know, the execute, the, uh, the fetch, decode, execute, store um, process to do our computing in sequence. And we work on three things, logic, memory, and communications. Logic is the processing, the transistors, etc. Memory is the storage of the data, and communications is the I.O., you know, shuttling data between different parts of the computer. And we focus on these three things. Right? But if you look at the future computer, there is a feeling that this future computer will need to be um, non-Boolean in nature because there is a lot of data today where uh, what we wish to extract from it uh, is, is qualitative rather than quantitative. So we want to do things like identify clusters of data, identify patterns in large amounts of data. And so there is a lot of interest in looking at new forms of computing that are inspired by things like biological information processing or quantum computing. Uh, we want to look at computers that are connected to sensors. You can think of it as a distributed form of computing, but that is where computing is headed in future. Right? So a lot of our work today in the material science device space is to look at this type of future computer, which is not just going to be a sort of scale transistor. Okay. So in, um, let me skip this. So in today's uh, talk, I will, I will give you three examples in three different directions, all related to information processing. Um, the first, I will stick to conventional computing and where that is headed. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about silicon and Moore's law and what might come after silicon, but sticking within the realm of conventional computing. Then I will say a few things about non-conventional computing, uh, non-von Neumannian computing, and, 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 and you know, how we can gain inspiration from biological insp uh, information processes and where that field is going. And then I will end with an example on what we call sensor-based physical analytics or sensor-based uh, uh, systems uh, similar in flavor to uh, some of the results that the previous speaker spoke. And this is an area where I'll give you an example from agriculture, and this is an area where I personally am very, very interested going forward. So let me start with the one on top. Okay, stick to conventional computing, and where is that technology going? Now, the graph here charts the progress of silicon microelectronics. In the 1980s to about 1990, computing technology, silicon microelectronics was bipolar transistor based. And those circuits started consuming enormous power, and so you ended up with sort of a heat bottleneck where the amount of heat generated in those chips was getting exceedingly high. So in 1990, there was a switch over in the field from bipolar to CMOS technology. Okay. And then from 1990 to about the mid-2000s were essentially the golden years of CMOS technology. Moore's law was followed over here. How many of you uh, do not know what Moore's law is? Please raise your hands. OK. So, Basically, what Moore's law says is that every 18 months to 24 months, the number of transistors on a chip reduces by half. Okay? So essentially what we do is shrink the size of a transistor. Here is a very simple schematic of a transistor. There is a silicon wafer, there's a source of electrons, a drain which collects the electrons, there is a gate which is an insulator, and there is an electrical contact on top of the insulator. Now if you place a little bit of charge on top of the insulator, which is a silicon oxide layer traditionally, then you get an image charge at the bottom of the oxide that changes the potential in the silicon, and that changes the current going from the drain to the source, so the transistor acts as a switch. Okay. So as you keep shrinking 
the length of this channel, you reduce the transit time of the electron or the hole, and the speed of the transistor increases. If you shrink everything together, then the voltage that you apply on the electrode reduces. The number of transistors uh, per unit area reduces. And so the energy or the voltage required per, um, per circuit reduces. So you get lower cost, higher performance, lower voltage operation. Right? Now this, is, this is basically the engine that drives Moore's law and is called Denard scaling of the transistor. So coming back to this chart, 1990 to 2005, we basically took the silicon chip, uh, took the silicon chip and the circuitry, we put it on a Xerox machine, we put you know, 2x shrink and press the start button. And we would do this every 18 months. And this is how we kept getting, uh, getting a smaller and smaller um, chips, cheaper chips. And this boom in classical scaling is essentially what has given you smartphones, the fact that you can store your images in Facebook for free, and the fact that today in a smartphone, you have more computing power than you did in a server in the 1990s. Okay. And this is mostly due to the microelectronics revolution. Now, the channel length, that, or, the, or the, you know, roughly the dimension of the transistor, by the time it came down to about 90 nanometers, uh, there were problems that started, and the silicon transistor had to be changed. We replaced the silicon oxide with a different material called hafnium oxide. We changed the material in the silicon by adding things like germanium. And we kept scaling this technology. And today we are at what is called the 22 nanometer mode node very soon. We'll go to what is called the 14 nanometer node, which will be, again, roughly the size of the transistor, very roughly. Okay? And then the transistor itself has now, instead of having a planar geometry, has become more like a fin. So we keep doing all these very expensive tricks to try to make the transistor smaller and smaller. And better performing. Okay. But the end of Moore's law is close. I think most people agree that in about 10 years' time, by the time we hit the 7 nanometer node, silicon technology scaling will come to an end. So the question then is, what next? Right? And if you stick to conventional technologies, okay, this is a sort of picture of a computer of the future. It will be a machine with no moving parts. It will have non-volatile memory, no hard drives. There will be huge banks of memory that will surround the processor. The memory will have to be cheap. Optical links will replace electrical links because of cost and power issues. Uh, there will be on-chip power conversion with things like magnetic inductors and gallium nitride technology. And there is tremendous interest now in trying to see if there is a replacement for the silicon transistor in order to have chips that can operate at voltages less than about 0.4 or 0.5 volts. Today, you work at about you know, maximum 0 0.7, 0 0.8 volts, minimum, I'm sorry. But you want to go down below about half a volt. Okay. So there's a lot of interest in trying to replace silicon with a drop-in replacement. Um, and carbon nanotubes are one such candidate that we had worked on and continue to work on extensively at IBM. So what I will show you first are some results with carbon nanotube technologies okay, uh, as a replacement for silicon. So while I was at IBM, which was about you know, four years ago, we looked at all the various options for replacing silicon. And uh, we lined up of the needs, the properties, and figured that there is only one material that, what, that we can hope will replace, uh, can replace silicon, and we found that to be carbon nanotubes. Okay? So we began a project trying to do carbon nanotubes, uh, looking at it in a very sort of technology-centric fashion to try to see if carbon nanotubes could be a viable replacement for silicon. There are three reasons why carbon nanotubes uh, are exciting. One is that they have a very high mobility, 20,000 centimeters square per volt second. 
Um, their, their band gap can be tuned down to 0 0.3, 0 0.4 uh, electron volts. And so they're compatible with low voltage operation. And number three, and one of the most important reasons, is that because it is a one dimensional structure, it has perfect electrostatics for making a very, very small transistor. Okay? And this is a huge advantage. This is the carbon electronics is made for one dimensional electronics. It is made for nanoscale transistors, which silicon is not. It's a long history of the development of carbon nanotubes. It began with work at IBM and Delft sometime in the late 1990s. A lot of things have happened. And basically, we are today at a space where my colleagues at IBM now have been developing CMOS inverter structures. Okay. The graph on the left is what I'd like to draw your attention to. It is the most important reason why one is so excited about carbon nanotubes. This is a plot done by my colleague David Frank at IBM. And what he did was he simulated a processor with one and a half million transistors using state-of-the-art projected performance of silicon transistors and per projected performance of carbon nanotube transistors using experimental data from single carbon nanotube transistors. And, and in this plot, what he's plotted here is the energy consumed and the performance. So you want the highest performance at the lowest energy possible. And what David was able to show that is that you can get a factor of about 5x improve in either performance or energy, and the two can trade off against one another if you can switch from silicon to carbon nanotubes. And this is the driving force behind interest in carbon nanotubes. There is no other material that can do this. This is how a carbon nanotube transistor would look like. It would contain about six to seven carbon nanotubes. The pitch would be about seven, eight nanometers or so. That's the source, that's the drain. Um, this is what would need to happen in order to have carbon nanotubes as a drop-in replacement for silicon. When you develop a technology, uh, you cannot just throw away a, a billion or a several billion dollar silicon foundry and say, look, I have a new material. I'm going to make a new, micro, you know, new circuits over here. So you want what are known as drop-in replacements. You want to introduce a new material with a minimally while minimally perturbing the existing process flow. So the idea is to be able to put carbon nanotubes in a sort of parallel array as a single layer on a silicon wafer. And once you have it as a single layer, you can use lithography to then pattern your devices as you see fit. So if we can do this, then I think this happens as a technology. Um, there are two challenges to be able to, be able to put these um, tubes on an array. One is you have to be able to have um, coverage of these without any defects. You know, so your defect rate should be less than one in 10 million, preferably less than one in a billion. So you have to be able to place carbon nanotubes exactly about six to seven nanometers apart without making mistakes. And the second is these tubes have to be very, very pure. Tubes come either semiconducting or metallic, and the semiconducting tubes have to be at least one in, uh, in about 10 million. So those are the two problems that people are working on. And the current records are that you can place these nanotubes about 100 nanometers apart. So there is a factor of 10 required in improvement. One needs a way to put them 10 nanometers apart. And right now, as far as purity is concerned, one has 99 point, actually today, 99% purity and you need a couple of more nines in front of it, so you're about two orders of magnitude away. Once these two happen, I think there's a very, very good possibility that this becomes a technology. Uh, these are results, uh, again, uh, while I was at IBM from the IBM team, um, a, a, an inverter at 50 nanometer pitch has been demonstrated. It's a CMOS inverter and some work using block copolymers to try to really get these uh, carbon nanotube pitch down to about 10 nanometers or so. Um, 
So now let me go to the second topic. What I spoke about till now was still traditional computing, traditional architectures. What we are interested in is simply replacing the silicon transistor with something else. Okay. But if you look at the way computing is going, um, there's a certain direction, and that is the sort of merging of memory and logic. So typically today in a computer, you have your processor that does the logic processing, and you have the memory. So if you want to do a calculation, you get a whole bunch of data from the memory, you pick what you want, you throw everything away. Right? And this gives rise to a memory bottleneck. You keep shuttling so much data back and forth from the memory that it makes your processes very, very inefficient. So the first step to that is to place memory close to different processors. So you have various, or you place memory, a, a processor close to memory. So now you have different processors and you can do what is called in-memory compute. If you push this even further so that there is no, no distinction between memory and logic, then you have what is called von Neumannian computing, where you're not looking at this distinction, and what you're trying to do here instead is that, is that your computation happens in parallel as a result of the interaction between the different signal processing paths. And this is what you want to have. There are two things that people are excited about. One is quantum computing, which I will not talk about today. And the other is what's called loosely neuromorphic computing, sort of biologically inspired computing. So when we think we're not you know, doing a computation, storing it in memory, bringing it back and forth, et cetera, we are not scientific precise in our in calculationally in our thinking but we are very good in making inferences and this is what we are very poor at in the world of computing and there is tremendous interest in trying to remedy this shortcoming so let me give you a uh, the, let's let's look at the table on top and i would like to compare some of the differences between biological information processing and our silicon system. So first of all, our switching speed in silicon systems is much higher. You know, computers work at gigahertz. Biological systems work at kilohertz. Silicon systems, the voltage, operating voltage is roughly about a volt. You need that so that there are very few errors in computing. Biological systems, on the other hand, work at about 100 millivolts. If we were to try to turn devices on and off at 100 millivolts, given that KT at room temperature is about 25 millivolts, we would have a lot of errors. We don't know how to deal with those errors, even if we were able to make a switch that could operate at 100 millivolts. Okay. Our on-off ratios are very high, 10 to the power 5. Again, has to do, deal with the fact that we cannot handle errors. We don't like variability. On the other hand, biological systems have lower on-off ratios, less than about 10 to the power 3. Now, there are two big differences coming up. One is fan out, that is one wire can channel out into how many wires. In our systems, in silicon, it's no more than three or four. We cannot handle fan out more than that. In biological system, that number goes into the tens of thousands. And this is a major difference. And I'll come to that shortly as to why that is. And it's related to the way we deliver power. Well, in, in, in our silicon systems, our power delivery is remote. We then send the electrons down a wire. There is joule heating loss, so we have to keep putting pumping stations that essentially beef up the voltage and pin the wire. <coughs> in biological systems, the, the power comes from the bath because of the differential diffusion of ions gives rise to a voltage spike that skims along an axon. It is a completely different way of power delivery, and that is what actually allows you to have this tremendous massive amount of fan out. So those are two big differences. Our silicon systems are not reconfigurable, meaning you can't you know, change the circuit on the fly, and we do it in very clumsy ways using software and so on. Biological systems have very high reconfigurability. Our silicon systems, we only have electrons and holes, and the only way we can modulate is by applying electrostatic fields. Biological systems, we have ions, we have functionalization. It is a much richer dynamic um, ability to, to be able to, uh, you know, deliver charge and control it. 
Okay? So those are basically the differences. So given these differences, going forward, there is tremendous interest in looking at new materials that can work at very low voltages. Today, most of our devices are working at higher than half a volt, typically closer to one volt. We want devices that will work at a few hundred millivolts, which means you want to look at materials that you can modify reproducibility at with very low energies. Right? This is where I think soft materials becomes important, moving away from semiconductors. But I personally think there is a lot of interest in sort of mixed oxide, oxy semiconductor, um, oxy chalcogenide semiconductors, where one can take advantage of their, their rich defect chemistry to be able to try to make materials that can be modified at a few hundred millivolts. We want to be able to try to engineer different clusters in, in being able to do so. If you look at the 1960s, uh, Shockley had wanted to do wiring using dislocations in semiconductors. Um, nothing came about in that, but maybe this is the time to look at being able to architect defects in atomic clusters for making new types of devices. Uh, we have to be able to figure out how to embrace variability. If you make transistors that work at 100 millivolts, they're not going to be all the same, okay? They're gonna fluctuate. We need to learn how to deal with that. And we have to learn, basically, the physics of learning. So those are the directions where a lot of nanosciences, material sciences, in information technology are headed today, okay? Uh, here are some examples. So if I look at, let us say, what are called neural networks, uh, this has been um, studied at least at an algorithmic level for over 40 years or so. And today, there are software neural networks. And if you have used Google or Amazon or the internet, you are using inadvertently software neural networks several times a day. Okay? The next move is to go from software to hardware chips that are specifically built for neural networks, but which still stick to traditional silicon CMOS. This is at an advanced R&D stage now. There are several companies that have chips coming out, which again, the driving force here is low power. So you are doing all of this so you can compute using much lower powers. And the next step beyond that is to look at new materials of the type that I was talking about, new non-silicon materials that can even give you even lower power operation um, of such neural networks. And there's a lot of different materials that people are studying that typically involve uh, you know, trying to make artificial synapses, artificial neurons. So if I take artificial synapses, for instance, there's a lot of interest in looking at chalcogenides or oxides and applying a voltage to create some change in it, which results in a different resistive state in the material that you can read. And that gives you a sort of synapse that can be weighted. There's phase change memory, resistive RAM, chemical bridge RAM. These are several of these examples of materials that people have worked on. Um, I will skip this. This was just interconnects and reconfigurability. I already spoke about this earlier. But basically, the, uh, I think going forward, there's very little work done today in trying to make interconnects um, the way biological systems do. Okay? And this is, so, so we are beginning a project at Argon in trying to build an artificial axon. So this brings me to my third topic, and I have just about 12 minutes left, so I'm on time. And this is sensor-fronted computing or sensor networks. It is related quite a bit to some of the things the previous speaker had said. So we all know of sensor networks and think of sensors in a room or in a field, and they are all wirelessly connected and the data goes to a cloud, and from the cloud, this data is available on your smartphones, etc. A lot of work going on there. Um, a lot of work 
is needed in taking that data and running it through physics models. Not much of this is happening. Because if you run this data through physics models, then you can get a lot more interpretation out of it. So this is a system that we call physical analytics. We started this work about 10, 12 years ago at IBM, and it is continuing. And I will give you an example of physical analytics through a two-year, three-year experiment that we have been doing with Gallo wineries in California in the USA. Okay. So Gallo wineries um, makes Cabernet Sauvignon grapes. Uh, it, we have a test field. Uh, in collaboration with Gallo in a place called Lodi, California. And the idea is very simple. Um, as the previous speaker mentioned, uh, when we deliver water or nutrients in agriculture, uh, we cannot measure them accurately. And because we cannot measure them accurately, we often overdose these nutrients. And this is a huge issue. So if you can measure and calculate the amount of water, there are tremendous benefits. And this experiment is an example of that. And to start with, what we did is we did something very simple. There are no, even no sensors involved. We took satellite images, which are free. You can get Landsat images throughout the world okay, with about a few hundred meter accuracy. And these satellite images come in eight wavelength bands. You can take that data and you can calculate essentially the greening of any cal canopy. So you can get roughly what are called chlorophyll maps. So we took this winery, sort of a test field, and we would calculate the greening. You get you know, two points of data for the same spot every month as the satellite goes over and over. So you can look at the greening of the canopy, and you can also get the temperature the wind speed, the humidity, all of that data is available. And from that, you can calculate, and I won't go into the details, but these are standard agronomy models. You can calculate how much water is going to be required by that plant. So what we did is we took a test field, and vineyards are typically irrigated using what is called drip irrigation. You look at the vineyards in Maharashtra, they also have drip irrigation. Drip irrigation is also used in India. And we took these drip irrigation lines and we pixelated them by putting throttle valves and so on, valves and so on, so that we can control the amount of water that goes to a 15 by 15 meter area, where there are roughly 40 to 50 grape vines. So we, we could calculate how much water you need, and then we dose that much amount of water. And we had a control area, and we had an experimental area, and these are pictures of the vineyard over here. Um, so we had a control and an experimental area. These are some pictures of the vineyard with the, uh, with the throttle valves, et cetera. And this is the key result over here. So we did a two-year experiment just based on greening of the canopy measurements with satellite and looking at the, the weather. Okay. So two things you want to look at. We looked at the yield. So we had two regions. One region we optimized for yield. One we optimized for water usage. Okay. So we measure yield, that is simple, tons per hectare. And as you can see that at the end of year two, we started getting about 20, 25% improvements in yield, just by doing this calculation. And, and with the goal of trying to even the greening of a canopy, okay? The water efficiency is measured in, um, in the amount of water you need to, uh, make a kilogram of the produce. Okay? And the water efficiency, we saw between 10 to 20% improvements. With the simple thing that we did, these are tremendous benefits. And it shows that by just measuring the amount of water, uh, you can really, really go very far in terms of conserving the water as well as improving yield. And this is simply the tip of the iceberg. Right? Um, if I look at uh, for instance, the amount of things that one can measure in agriculture, and this is an exhaustive list. And then you can use this in models to calculate the amount of water and fertilizer and pesticides you need. Okay? You can revolutionize agriculture. To start with, there are just two things that, 
that, that, that are important to measure that will already revolutionize the field. One is something the previous speaker had mentioned, and that was soil moisture, and the other is soil nitrates, yeah, dissolved nitrates. Nitrates are volatile, they keep, their concentration keeps going up and down, and you need to measure that. And you cannot do point measurements, you have to measure it averaged, over feet or meters, because this thing, you know, it, 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 because of things like uh, porosity in the soil and water flowing through the soil, point measurements can often uh, not give you representative data. Okay. Um, cost is a big factor in all of this, and this is what has prevented, um, you know, sensor-based agriculture. Today, you can buy these sort of units. And they cost anywhere from between $800 to $2,500. And they'll get you a sensor, little wireless hub, power supply, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And that is very, very expensive. Let us just take an example. Um, so grapes, you know, wine grapes, are about $10,000 for one acre. Sugar cane in India is about $1,000 or $1,500 equivalent an acre. Wheat. In, 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 in the Midwest, in the United States, winter wheat is less than $100 per acre. So it's a huge range. Okay? So if I take, as an example, sugar cane, it's $1,500 an acre. If I get a 10% benefit, that's $150 an acre. If I want a three-year return on investment, my sensor node needs to be about $10 per sensor node. It needs to include the sensor, needs to include a wireless, battery, everything. If I want to use this for something like wheat, that number has to be a couple of orders of magnitude lower. I believe, it is my personal belief, that this will come, and this will be the big thing that the Internet of Things will enable going forward. It will be about doing benefits to things like agriculture and water globally. Um, a couple of the things that we are working in Chicago is now in the measurement of the things I pointed out, soil moisture and dissolved nitrates. There are many challenges. Uh, soil type and texture is important because you measure properties like dielectric properties of soil, and that is, that is affected both by the texture of the soil as well as the amount of water, salinity, moist, you know, spatial variability, ion content. So these, these are complicated measurements, but they have to be cheap. That is the challenge. But in the end, we envision a system where there will be sensors in the ground they will, be wire, the, they will be wirelessly linked. One will have to solve problems of wireless transmission underground. They will be connected to a wireless hub that will send it to the cloud. So at the University of Chicago, using the concept of the university as a lab, we are setting up such a hub and will be using sensors for moisture uh, and things like dissolved nitrates and so on. Okay. So, this is the end of my talk, and I will um, end with a couple of closing uh, thoughts here. First is that if you look into the future, look for in information processing, look for new non-Boolean computing approaches that, that provide the promise of ultra-low power computing, a uh, lot of interest in trying to um, analyze and look for patterns in masses of data. That is what big data and analytics has given to us. Uh, silicon scaling will end, I think, within the next 10 years. And look for physical analytics or Internet of Things that's sensor-based. This will boom in the next 10 to 20 years and can, can really affect things like agriculture, and water management. And finally, a more personal comment, uh, something I have realized through my career today, there is tremendously fast propagation of technology. Um, when I was growing up in India, something that came out of the West took three to four years to then propagate over here. Uh, today, it is very different. I come here in India from Northeast India. It's a very different place uh, from Bangalore or Delhi. Okay. Uh, but even there, a uh, few years ago, in remote places, I found you know, people were using um, solar lanterns and storage technologies that used uh, you know, tungsten-doped lithium-ion phosphate. It is a state-of-the-art solid-state electrolyte. You know, Ultra-bright gallium nitride um, 
LEDs. These are things that were developed just a few years ago, and these are rapidly migrating globally. So I think this sort of equilibration of you know, the effective technology potential across the world, now this is happening much faster today and, and, and moving into older societies than it happened in the past. And so I conclude with this picture that I found amusing. Uh, this, is, this is a puja going on in India. And in addition to the traditional gods and goddesses, uh, what you find is that they have added a laptop and, uh, you know, and an iPad and things like that. And, and, and I think this is where technology is headed. Thank you very much. So friends, so that's the great, the address by Suprati Guha, who started his lecture from future computer, then started elaborating about the conventional and non-conventional computing. Then he gave the, he differentiated between this, the microelectronic revolution and the, the nanotubes and all. I think ended with the sensors which gave a lot of benefit to the uh, farmers and ended with uh, the, a picture of uh, puja, which really <laughs> connects our the culture of the Indian heritage. So I think give him a big applause for a wonderful, very uh, informative lecture of Suprati Guha. Friends, due to the paucity of time, we will not take any questions. I think uh, uh, maybe during the coffee break, we'll, uh, you can meet uh, uh, Professor and uh, discuss or take any clarification during the coffee break. So with this, uh, thank you very much. Uh, before we leave, uh, I would request Dr. Maheshapa to give a memento to uh, Professor Supratik Kohar. <laughs>